I am a non-redneck 18-year-old dude from a small town Oklahoma. And this happened about a year ago. My town is the kind of town where everyone knows each other. Nothing scarier. You unusual really happens here. Sore so I thought anyway. There's a lot of meth has an alcoholics here though, but they never do anything to anyone. Next door to my home is a nice little house. It has been renovated and it looks pretty good. Eventually, some people from California moved into the house. And after a month, they finally came over to introduce themselves. While me and my band were practicing in our garage. The husband introduced himself as Steve and the wife's name was Kathy. They were really cool actually. It seems like a really heard friendly laid back people if you know what I mean. They told us that they loved hearing us play and talked about several concerts that they had been to that even told us or they've seen the group the Red Hot Chili Peppers. We thought they were so cool and loved talking to them. Steve would often come over whenever he'd see us unloading groceries or furniture and help us out. But slowly after time passed, we noticed Steve started acting weird. He came over one day to help us unload a washing machine into our house. He was just really indifferent. He acted nervous and wouldn't say much to me or my mom. One night, me and my bandmates were sitting in the garage, writing music with all the doors shut when we heard Steve and Kathy having sex in their backyard. Normally this will be funny, but it was actually scary sounding. They will make me really weird sounds. Not SEC sounds like demonic grunting and weird screeching sounds. We all got really uncomfortable and went inside to write more. They definitely weren't acting the way they did when we first met. But this is where things started to get really scary. One night, at around 11 I was going outside to my car to grab something I have forgotten earlier in the day, and omitted around the corner of my house and stopped to hit the unlock button to my car. The front lines of the car flashed towards the garage, revealing Steve standing directly in front of the garage door was just staring at me with a blink of motionless expression. And when the lights to my car went off, I pointed at him and said, Whoa, what the fuck dude? What are you doing in our driveway? He responded with a very slurred and slow voice. I was just checking for intruders around your house. I didn't mean to scare you. The way he talked. He sounded drunk and nervous. And I told him, well, you really need to leave man, this really isn't cool. Then you started to beg me. Please don't tell Kathy she hurt me. I'm too scared to. He just stopped talking, turned around and walked back through the front side of his privacy fence, and he was gone. Just like that. The next day, I went over to the front door to maybe talk to Kathy about what happened and knocked on the door hoping to get a response from Kathy, at least, but no one would answer. I didn't see them at least for a whole week until the next incident. I was laying in bed one night on the phone with my girlfriend and I began to hear knocking sounds on my walls. I wasn't freaked out at first, because it was a school night and I wasn't supposed to be on the phone that late. I thought it was my mom in the room next door knocking, to tell me to shut up. So I hung up with my girlfriend and went to my mom's room to find her asleep. Then it hit me. I woke up my mom asking her if it was her knocking on the walls. She told me no. I was so freaked out. Sure, I rushed back to my room, towards the back of the house, to see a black silhouette of a man outside the back door, just standing there. I went into my room, grabbed my 22 rifle. I came back out and looked at Jordan, I'd no one standing there anymore. I was so puzzled. I went to the front door to look at the people and nearly shipped myself. I looked down to find Steve standing there, staring into the people from outside as a still as a statue. After about 30 seconds of this, he bent down below the people to where I couldn't see him. I told my mom to call the cops, but by the time they came, he was gone. They wouldn't were just use house and knocked on the door for about five minutes. But no one answered or turned up. Fast forward to about two weeks later. We haven't heard or seen from Steve or Kathy that basically ended up and just disappeared. One day my mom was at her Zumba dance class talking to her friends about it. 
and one of her friends actually knew Kathy and Steve very well. She hadn't seen them either. But when she told my mom sent chills down my spine, she said that Steve and Kathy had started getting into satanic worship in their own home, which is right next door to my house. No one knows where they are or where they went. And I wouldn't mind if they stayed that way. I just can't forget the way Steve stared at me through that people. I graduated high school this year, and I moved out to a city. I feel safer here to be honest. But I'll never know what happened to Steve and Kathy. In the fall of 2016, a friend of mine and I decided to go hiking late in the afternoon in a densely wooded wilderness area in the mountains not far off from Fayetteville, Arkansas. My friend Rick was close to 60 at the time and recovering from a triple bypass he'd undergone around 60 months earlier. We had been hiking this and other trails for about a year following his operation, destroying thing his cardiovascular health. That day, a weekday, I hiked with a bottle of water, my wallet and my keys, but nothing else. Nothing to protect myself. The trail we picked is a popular weekend hiking spot that we had taken dozens of times before. We were both comfortable with the hike and had never had a problem on that path or any other for that matter. While Rick is older, and at the time, a little more feeble after his health problems. I was in my mid-40s, well over six feet tall, and in pretty good shape. So it wasn't really very worried about our safety. The trail we were on is in a state park adjacent to Federal Parkland. It's an outdoors enthusiast dream. Most of our track that day was completely uneventful. We just enjoyed the autumn leaves and chatted casually as the sun drops lower in the evening sky. We had seen nobody else that day which was probably to be expected given that we chose to hike late afternoon on a weekday. We completed about four miles of the six-mile loop. And up to that point, it was uneventful as any other on our way back to the car, and about two miles from the parking lot. We spotted someone through an opening in the trees, I saw young woman, probably a college student on the trail ahead of us and moving in our direction. First glance, I paid her very little attention as the distance between us disappeared. That change. I did not know her, so I could have been mistaken. But there was something about her posture and expression that seemed off. As she got closer, it struck me that she had a semi-panicked look on her face and was moving quite frantically. But she wasn't in athletic gear, so maybe she was just booking it for some cardio. She occasionally turned her head and stared over her shoulder. I followed her eyes and eventually noted another woman about 50 yards behind her walking up the path through the trees. The second woman was not wearing hiking gear. In fact, her clothing struck me as totally inappropriate. It was a warm afternoon and we were well inside of what is the state park area miles from many homes, but she was wearing semi-formal clothes offers casual attire and a light jacket. I thought the clothes must have been second-hand because they were tattered, ill-fitting, and didn't look washed. She was a fit, athletic-looking woman who couldn't have been more than 25 or 30 years of age. It was too bizarre. The clothes are wrong for the trail. And they were wrong for someone her age. Everything was off about her. Her shoe struck me as being even more peculiar. When she got closer, I noticed she was wearing scuffed leather flask casual shoes with no ankle support. I found it completely odd because you just don't see people on this trail dress as she was. And you've never seen them wearing shoes like that. My hiking partner, Rick hadn't appeared to notice anything odd. As he was completely involved in the conversation and just kept talking. The second woman briefly glanced up and we made eye contact as she neared us. The alarm bells went off in my head. There was something in her eyes that made me feel uncomfortable. I don't know what she was thinking if I'm being honest. But I swear she had contempt in her face. Part of me wonder whether I offended her by staring. So I diverted my eyes and and kept walking. I tried to tell myself that maybe she was homeless. And she was wondering, we only think she had and I was just being rude that the warning bells were still going off in my head. I'm not a paranoid person. So having my sixth sense going nuts left me unsettled. 
I have fantastic peripheral vision. So I turned my face toward Rick and acted like I was listening to him. But I was watching the creepy woman out of the corner of my eye. The moment we passed, she spun her head around to study, so she slowed her pace. My internal alarms grew louder. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw her come to a stop and drop her face toward the ground. Her body half turned on the trail. It was very odd behavior. Rick and I kept walking before the trees obscured her from view. She was still standing there. Her face was down, but she was staring a hole through us out of the corner of her eyes. That was the first time I realized that I couldn't see her hands. One was inside her jacket pockets, and the other was hidden from my view on the other side of her body. It creeped me the hell out. The hair on the back of my neck stood for a half mile. I didn't see her again, and have begun to wonder whether the first woman that C.O. Ed had felt dangerous. Well, clearly she had I thought, and that's why she was practically running through the woods at dusk. It also struck me that creepy woman had stopped and studied Rick and me like she was deciding on whom to follow. We weren't moving as fast. We were walking as quickly as we could manage. And he was clearly more feeble than the CO Ed those thoughts amped up my senses, and I still felt uneasy, so I periodically checked behind us. At certain points through the woods, I could see more than 100 yards. Nothing, I began to worry about the cohort. My hair stood up for a second time as I felt the strongest sensation of being watched. Again, thinking I was paranoid, and half mocking myself for being afraid of the creepy woman. I turned my head around to assure myself she was not back there. I was wrong. She was there, following with her head down and moving briskly about 100 yards behind us. With her hands hidden. I turned my head back to the trail in front of us and kept walking. Still trying to convince myself that there was nothing out of the ordinary happening. But I was just being rude because she was dressed like a homeless woman. About 200 yards further along the path. I turned my head back to record my heart race a bit. She closed half the distance. Each time we would walk around the bend in the woods obscured her location, she would emerge much closer to us than the next opening. I told myself that I was just being paranoid, but nevertheless, I tried to get ready to pick up the pace of bits. By this time, he was clearly aware that we were being followed and was pretty uncomfortable as well. So to his credit, he did keep talking with a half amount ago, before we reached the parking area. I turned my head once again and she was just 10 feet behind us. I hadn't seen her hurt her get that close and it freaked me out. I literally jumped one of her hands was in her pocket and the other was behind her back. You I got the distinct feeling that she had a weapon of some kind and that she had no fear of me despite the fact that I was considerably taller. I'll be several years older. There was no mistaking her demeanor. She meant to do us harm or at the very least, she intended to intimidate us. I weed my car keys between the knuckles of my right hand and handed my water bottle to Rick, made the obvious fist with my left hand. With a half mile left in our hike, I thought to myself, if this is nothing, she'll pass us and move on. As clue as she's moving a lot faster than we were. I was accustomed to people overtaking us when I walked with Reg. But she didn't pass and never acted like she knew where we were, which was the creepiest part. I kept my head turned toward her as I walked and tried to get her to make eye contact. But she didn't look me in the eyes. At first. She kept acting like neither Rick nor I were on the path just feet ahead of her, and she slow to follow closely behind. I was completely unnerved, and that made me angry. I wanted her to see how pissed I was at to convey with a look that messing with me was a mistake. When she finally did make eye contact with me. I glared and clenched my fist. There was an instant where I couldn't read her expression. She was simply blank. But as she studied my face, she appeared simultaneously agitated and a little less confident. I was conveying one look in my face, back the fuck off. And at this point, I didn't give a damn if it appeared rude. She apparently thought better of whatever she was doing, 
and slowed her pace as a distance between us grew to about 20 feet, but she was tense and catch whatever she had in her hand, hidden behind her back. I never saw her hands. I know she had some kind of weapon. I was mentally preparing to charge her if I saw a gun or a knife. As I knew Rick could not outrun her. I thought to myself, I just have to surprise her. I also realized I needed to have her in front of us. After a few 100 feet, about a quarter mile away from where our car was parked. She was still stalking us, and I had enough. I wasn't equal measures afraid and furious. I told Rick that we were going to stop and let her pass loud enough for her to hear it. Just as I was getting ready to stop on the trail and make her walk in front of us. She veered into a small clearing, plowing through waist-high brush, crossed a ditch and scurried through a line of trees to a road that ran through the woods between the main road and the parking area. I kept my eyes on her the whole time. She had a car that was parked along the little service road, practically hidden by shrubs, not in the parking lot. The last time we made eye contact was just before she climbed into her car. It was clear from the expression on her face that she was very angry. I glared to her expressing my own anger, but kept walking. When her car started, she drove away. Rick got quiet before asking me. What the hell was she doing? Is she have a gun? I told him I didn't know. I never saw a weapon. We walked back to our car without saying another word. Once the engine was on and all the doors were shut, we chatted a bit more about it and decided to call the authorities to report the incident and to make sure to have them check on the poor, co-ed, who was passed first. To this day, I have no idea what that creepy woman was planning to do. Robbers harmless scares, I have no idea. I'm just thankful she decided better of it. I have hiked that trail more than 50 times since. But I've never seen her again. Through most of my life, I found most of my younger memories tend to be forgotten, except for one in particular. I was seven or eight at the time. And now staying the night at my friend's house. We live in a fairly small town in Ohio, known as Fountain City. My friend's family consisted of her and her mom. There was no need for them to have a large home. They lived in a nice neighborhood where all the smaller homes resided. Her house was one story and harder, dark, damp basement as well. Her house's layout plans were a part of an understanding of the story. Facing forward from the front as soon as you walked inside, you would be standing in the middle of the living room. If you continued forward and turned to the left, there was a small hall. There was one door to the far left. That was my friend's mom's room. Now the other side of the hall was the bathroom in my friend's room that was right of the bathroom. Her room was a standard eight-year-old girl's room, a single bed, pink fuzzy rug, etc. On this night, we thought we would rather be badass for staying up to 11 o'clock. After turning off the TV, we navigated our way through the dark to her room. Because of her bed size, I volunteered to sleep on the rug. Sleep came fast and engulfed me, but I was interrupted from my slumber. Looking ahead, I thought I saw something rather someone. Then I turned to look at my friend who had also woken up and had taken notice of what I was seeing. She was tall and her shoulders and chest hung low. Her arms were long, abnormally long. I was startled to say the least. I caught up my friend's mom's name quietly. I winced at my own voice, and didn't even respond, slowly walking forward. This is when I took notice, towards rather pale complexion. My friend's mom wasn't pale at all. I told myself, it was just the lighting. We watched it walk into the bathroom and listen as the old door softly shuts. I glanced at the clock, realizing it was 3.15 a.m. It was only later that I'd realized the significance of that time. I lay down, but couldn't sleep. I laid away for what seemed like hours. Eventually, I slept and woke up. When I did, I took notice to my friend as she was to awake. We talked about it. And we both agreed that it was her mom. It had to be. We went in and greeted her. 
I worked up the courage and found myself asking your mom as she happened to go to the bathroom at three. She looked back at me and said no. Why? My friend and I came clean and told her everything. She laughed and shook it off. But it was real, was very real. I had no other explanation to what we had seen. We never talked about it again. A few years later, my friend moved. But every time when we go on walks and we pass her house, again uneasy feeling and refuse to look at it. And I know she feels it too. In the summer of 1958, my aunt Kathleen on my father's side and her two sisters Helen Goodlow and Faye Horn bought a large two-story rock house on top of Mount Kessler outside of Fayetteville, Arkansas. It belonged to the Hockaday Girls School in Dallas. So it was a beautiful, well-appointed home in the summer of 1959. When I was 15 years old. My mother and I traveled with my other aunt and uncle, who was a Ford dealer, to visit them and his brand new Grenadian color galaxy. We turned off a two-lane blacktop onto a gravel road that wound up through the woods and came out into a clearing where the house was. As we climbed, I was certain I saw something off in the dark woods and brought it to the attention of the others. But they seemed to not see anything. I was glad to be in the car from what it looked like kind of stooped over. We had a nice dinner, warmed by the fire in the fireplace, that about eleven retired to our respective rooms. Mine was on the second floor with two windows in the side of the house and two facing the large lawn which ran to the woods which completely encircled the area. There were no neighbors in any direction. I went off to sleep, but something in the realm of maybe 1.30 a.m. or 2.30 a.m. A strange noise from our side awakened me. It was kind of like an eerie call that I've never heard before. I got into bed without turning on a light and went to the window on the side of the house. There was a light pole by a brick building on the edge of the woods that I understood was filled with some kind of electrical equipment that would be checked a couple of times a month by utility workers. I could see in the dimly lit woods, a disturbance of the trees, but nothing presented itself. I went back to bed and the next day mentioned this at breakfast, but nothing was coming of it. My aunt and her sisters were kind of pale though, but denied knowing anything about it. They also assured me, the house was always securely locked at night. We made a day trip to Shepherd of the Hills County in Missouri the next day. And on our late afternoon return, I noticed Kathleen and Helen talking with each other as they walked around the outside of the house looking closely at the ground. We turned in at about 11.30 that night, and I went to sleep quickly. I got up to use the bathroom at about 2 in the morning in the window, and the upstairs bathroom was about halfway up. As I did my business, I could hear far off in the woods the sound of two beings running. It seemed like one would stop periodically while the other kept getting closer. Then I heard sounds that I had heard the night before. I hadn't turned the light on and made my way back to my room in bed. I didn't sleep much that night and was glad to be inside the house. I didn't say anything about what I had heard the previous night or the next day. We only stayed one more day. And the three ladies really hated to see us go. They called us the place of the singing house far. And the house was beautifully furnished and comfortable. However, they felt like it was too isolated even for three ladies. And especially one of the two wanted to leave and travel. They sold the place in 1961 or 1962. And we never went back. But I always wonder what was making that noise. And I got a glimpse of what it was. I wonder why if that's the real reason they left. This is a story I always wanted to share with the world. But I was never sure if I remember this one correctly. It is one of the many scary things that had happened in the small village in Calabria, Italy, that my dad originates from. We personally witnessed spooky things ourselves there, and they would make great scary stories as well. But I want to talk about what my grandpa witnessed when he was younger and lived in the village. I guess this happened before he came to Germany as a guest worker around the 50s. Perhaps maybe even earlier. The story is more known for being that one time when grandpa almost killed his own brother. So listen on. The village used to be a place consisting of a few families that owned farms. 
and this is what they primarily lived off of. My family owned and still owns fields of olive trees and they used to be shepherds. In a certain season, there will be a lot of work. And there would be migrant workers from other places in Italy that would travel around for finding work on farms. My great-grandfather was in need of help and let five of these guys work for him as stable boys and field workers. They were given a commendation and in a little barn. From then on strange things happened in the village. Every other day, a dead sheep would be found and other farmers in the village complained about dead animals as well. But rumor went around started by the migrant workers that said that one of the migrant workers would always disappear at night and come back in the early morning, often with a shirt missing or blood-stained clothing. My family did not take this too seriously and blamed a wild stray dog or a wolf for these happenings. In our area in Italy, we have problems with these animals to this day. Stray dogs from packs occasionally find their way into villages and beaches and attack what is walking around there freely, animal or human. So one night, my grandfather and my great-grandfather had a few of my dad's uncles and they would stay up late and wait for the animal to appear with their guns ready. It was dangerous and difficult venture. The nice start early in the area in Italy. And once it's dark, it is dark. You can't see anything that is standing one meter away from you. You can barely see your hand in front of your eyes. It's super dark. So my grandfather and the others were patrolling the farm with torches that they had had. The sheep are going crazy. They all came together and ran towards the noise source. They were about to go into the stable and hoping to find the troublemaker and kill it, they noticed that the bushes next to the stables rushed on. Of course they suspected a stray dog died in there. But also, we're not too sure. One of my dad's uncles went to investigate. He didn't have a tour, so he was better to aim to shoot the dog. He approached the bush when suddenly the thing in the bush went crazy and sounded like my great uncle was attacked by this thing. It was hard to see in the darkness and the torches weren't a big help as a source of lies. Some wrangling went on and everyone became super nervous. Eventually, my dad's uncle advised to shoot. My grandfather wanted to act quickly and without thinking much shot aimlessly towards the bus. Suddenly, silence. The bush would not move and no movement from my uncle was noticeable. After a few milliseconds, it would wrestle again and my grandfather would vaguely make out a figure running away on our force. Not like a wolf-like creature, more like a mixture of a human being and a wolf, or a human being that tried to be a wolf. When the small shock was gone, everyone went to look to what happened to my dad's uncle. He was bleeding out of his breasts, the bullet sticking out of his skin. He survived this incident with a lot of luck. By investigating that place the next day, they found out that in the bushes was a big rock. My grandfather most probably was hit by that rock, and the bullet was sent right into my uncle's right breast. They found out that another sheep was in fact attacked inside that sable in a coincidence or not the migrant worker being suspected to disappear every night was never seen again. The first thing that was discussed in the village was that a werewolf others shrugged it off as a disease that will make its rounds in the area in its time. It was called the werewolf disease, a mental disease where people would act strange by night, gain a lot of strength and attack people or animals, often going and attacking or killing sprees when the knife breaks in. My dad firmly believes that this incident happened and no matter who or what really the attacker was in the end, he used to listen to the story of my grandfather when he was little when his uncle visited them in Germany. He asked if he could see the scar from one of the bullish duck in his skin. My great-uncle would unbutton his shirt to reveal a prominent scar on his right breast, 